you have a moral obligation as a parent to encourage your child to go out into the world, right? And to be whoever they can be. To be the best they can possibly be. And in doing that, you're, offer, you're encouraging them to pursue the good. You're sacrificing them to the good. You're not keeping them for yourself selfishly. You're telling them that they can go out and live their life and live it properly. And, and that's the parallel to the idea of the sacrifice of Isaac, as far as I can tell. You don't want for your son what it is that you want for him. You want for your son what would be best for him and for the world. And you let go in precise proportion to your desire to have that happen. You know, the psychoanalyst, the great psychoanalyst, I think, the psychoanalyst, I think this is actually Freud's dictum, but I, I'm not certain of that. He said, the good mother fails. Which is a, it's a brilliant observation, because when you have an infant, you do everything for the infant, because the infant can do nothing for him or herself. But as the infant matures, and is increasingly capable of doing things for him or herself, then you pull back, right? You pull back, and every time the child develops the ability to do something, you allow them, or encourage them to do it, and you don't interfere. You know, so if your child is struggling getting dressed, well, obviously there's some times that you help them, but mostly you let them learn so that they can know how to do it in the future. That's better for you, and it's certainly better for them. There's a rule if you're working with the elderly in an old age home, and the rule is something like, oh, don't do anything for any, of the, for any of the guests, let's say, that they can do for themselves. Because you compromise their independence, and so... As a mother, you pull back, and you pull back, and you let your child hit him or herself against the world, and you fail to protect them. But by failing to protect them, you encourage and ennoble them to the point where you're no longer necessary. Now, they may still want to see you, and it would be wonderful if that was the case, but the point is, is that you're supposed to remove yourself from the equation by encouraging your child to be the best possible person that person can be. And you sacrifice your desires, all of your desires to that, your personal desires, even your desires for your child in relationship to you. Because you want them to move forward into the world as a light, right? As a light on a hill. That's what you want, if you have any sense. And so you don't get to keep your children at home because you need them. Now, I'm talking generally, obviously, and there are circumstances under which families make their own idiosyncratic decisions, and I'm not trying to damn everyone with a, with a casual gesture, you know, but the point is still strong, that the good father is precisely someone who is willing to sacrifice his child to the ultimate good. That's dramatized in this story, you know, and it's brutal, but... The world is a brutal place, and much wisdom comes out of catastrophe. And this is an indication of how much catastrophe our ancestors had to plow through, had to work through, in order to generate the substructure for the conceptions of freedom even that we have today, for freedom and the good. And that's how the story appears to me. Conceptualize a future that we want, to let go of the things that are stopping us from moving forward, and to free ourselves from the chains of our original preconceptions. And that's laid out in these old stories as the optimal pathway of being. And there's a philosopher of science named Karl Popper, a very sensible and down-to-earth person, who was talking about thinking and its nature. And he was thought about thinking in a Darwinian fashion. He said, the purpose of thinking is to let your thoughts die instead of you. It's a brilliant notion. And so the idea is something like, you can conjure up a representation of yourself. You can conjure up a variety of potential representations of yourself into the, in the future. You can lay out how those future representations of yourself are likely to prevail or fail. You can cull the potential yous in the future that will fail. And then you can embody the ones that will succeed. You do that well simultaneously conjuring up a representation of your current state. And determining for yourself... 
because of your undue suffering, which elements of your pathetic being need to be given up so that you can move forward into that future? What is it that you're trying to do? Well, you're trying to improve the future. We believe that the future can be improved. We believe that it can be improved as a consequence of our sacrificial work. And so, once again, what are the limitations? What are the limits to that? What are the necessary limits to that? I would say we don't know. I would say as well that that's actually something that the entire corpus of biblical stories is trying desperately to articulate, to figure out and articulate, right? We, 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 we conjured up this remarkable idea. The future exists. We can see it even though it's only potential. We can adjust our behavior in the present in order to maximize our probability of success in the future. How best to do that? Well, the idea is something like don't hesitate to offer the ultimate sacrifice if you want the future to turn out ultimately well. Now, obviously, that idea is clothed in metaphysical speculation and religious imagery, but it still remains an intensely practical issue, right? What is it that you could contract for, let's say, if you were willing to give up everything about you that's weak and unworthy? <laughs> 